Welcome to uh, the Glenn Show. Harold uh, Glenn Lowry here, bloggingheads.tv, Brown University, with my friend Harold Pollock, University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, and frequent uh, guest at the Glenn Show. Uh, so, Harold, in the world of uh, public health, we're going to talk public health, we're going to talk politics, uh, we're going to talk uh, uh, moral sanction and memory and religion. Uh, in, the, in the world of public health, what's going on in Chicago that's interesting? Well, let's see. Uh, I guess there's a couple of things going on in Chicago. Uh, uh, our crime rate is down, but it's not down as much as uh, we had hoped. And uh, uh, there's a lot of conversation about it. And uh, you know, we, can see, we continue to see uh, these tremendous disparities across neighborhoods in Chicago in violence rates that are... Uh, that are concerning and that make violence, uh, uh, you know, actually a very rare phenomenon in much of the city. And yet we have uh, very high homicide rates uh, comparatively in the south and west sides of the city. And uh, well, that's that's a, a perennial uh, truth about urban life, is it not? I mean, isn't something like half of the homicides that occur uh Black men below the age of 35 as both perpetrators and victims. I mean, some number on that scale. Uh, yeah. You might know the aggregate statistics, but I'm, just, I'm talking about nationally. I'm talking about uh, murder rates. Here. No, it's quite disproportionate. And it's certainly true in Chicago. Uh, you know, the, the homicide rates among non-Hispanic whites are extremely low. And the homicide rates among Latinos uh, are also pretty low. And uh, so it is, uh, you know, it is... It's significant to a significant extent, uh, you know, concentrated among young African American men, and 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 of course the gun issue is a big part of that too. That uh, uh, it is, you know, it it is really hard to deal with that problem with the uh, you know ready availability of uh, of handguns to the uh, uh, you know to the extent that they're available when you can, and, you know, we're we're working on well, ways to try to seal that off, but. Uh, you know, those are well, the perennial issues are there. Uh, yeah. do, do you do you really think that um, perhaps I shouldn't put it that way? <laughs> um, uh, I, I want to raise two different kind of questions. You started out saying there was variation across neighborhoods and in the incidence of violence. Yeah. And then we acknowledge that uh, there was a racial uh, gender age uh, gradient that accounted for a whole lot of the variation. Why even look at it in terms of neighborhoods? Because it's not really, it, is it? It's not really neighborhoods that we're talking about, or is it? And then the other thing is, you say availability of guns. So that's an environmental factor. Uh, if only we could keep the guns out of their hands. Uh, are we really dealing with whatever the cultural dynamic is uh, that? Uh, allows uh, cycle, cultural, whatever, you know, you want to make it economic and political, okay, we can, but those are starting to feel to me like second order issues relative to whatever it is that's going on that uh, causes the rates of violence to be so order of magnitude disproportionately high in this identifiable demographic. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you see the question that I'm raising. Let's not dodge the issue. Black men under the age of 35 are killing each other. And uh, that's uh, not the NRA's fault. Uh, no, it's not the NRA's fault. Uh, on the other hand, if you compare American cities to many Canadian and European cities, what you find is similar rates of interpersonal violence on everything that doesn't involve guns. So, I mean, it really is true that the guns are a distinctive moderating thing that's going on here that, you know, the guns are not the only issue, but I can tell you that there are many, I've looked at case reports of many, many homicides where you have, you know, conflict between young people that just would not have led to a death if somebody wasn't carrying a gun. And, uh, you know, we really do have, uh, the guns really are a significant distinct issue. They're not, not uh, okay, but, so it's, it's not the but only those issue. Those guns are out there. Mm -hmm. But those guns are out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not supposed to be about guns, but I really do think this point is important. And if I'm wrong, I need to be corrected. Um, how the hell are you going to get the hundreds of millions of firearms that are in private hands out of them? And as long as they're there, how the hell are you going to inhibit people who want to get their hands on them 
from getting them. Well, and since in, in, in since in, there is a, both a constitutional provision and a very powerful lobby concerned about the extent to which whatever it is that you might do might infringe upon their liberties, uh, are we not fiddling while Rome burns to the extent that we worry about keeping guns out of the hands of gangbangers who are determined to uh, do violence to one another? Well, it's a complicated thing because it's true there's a lot of guns out there and that might lead us to be very pessimistic. On the other hand, uh, we have a lot of evidence that a lot of criminals have difficulty actually getting access to guns and that many of the, the crimes that are committed with guns are committed by people who don't have a legal right to have one. Uh, by any, even by the NRA's preferred legal framework, and that there's a lot we can do to interfere with that thin market for guns that may be effective. Uh, so, you know, we've been uh, talking to people in jails who are gun offenders to try to understand not only where they get their guns, but why are they carrying their guns around in situations when violence might occur? Because, you know, if someone has a gun, especially you have a 19 year old guy and he's got a gun but he keeps it hidden behind grandma's house because he's afraid that uh, he's going to get caught with it. Uh, and then he gets into it on the street because some guy is looking at his girlfriend. Well, he doesn't have that gun in his waistband to pull out and shoot that other guy. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that you can do to... Well, sure. I mean, you can, you can have magnetometers on police officers. Mm -hmm. You could probably even devise a mechanism that would allow them at some distance to determine whether or not a person had a heavy metal object on their person by scanning them. Uh, and then uh, you might be able to reduce the number of guns around the street. Maybe this is worth doing. I don't, uh, I don't know. Maybe the imposition on liberty associated with that would be over the line. Uh, I don't know. But I still want an answer to my question. What the heck is going on with these guys? Yeah. You know, I mean, this is aberrant. This endangers everybody, or does it? Certainly it generates a perception of unsettling Unsafe. Yeah, no, well, there's. And, uh, are, you know, I mean, to get technocratic about it when, in fact, we've got such a, uh, such a uh, aberrant and deeply disturbing uh, pattern of behavior being manifest in our society, I mean, who gets held accountable for that? You know, uh, there got to be enough failures to go around. It can't just be policy as well. Well, I think this, you know, if I think if you name your suspect, it's a little bit like the murder on the Orient Express where, you know, there's a there's there's a ton of suspects and they're all guilty. I, I think that, the, you know, really, uh, you know, pretty much anything that someone identifies as a potential issue has placed some role. You know, culture, a culture of violence plays some role. Lack of opportunity plays a big role. Uh, family issues play a big role. I mean, I must say what I'm focused on is much more what are the interventions that we can do that would be helpful and we know that 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 summer youth employment can be helpful uh, we, uh, my colleague Sarah Heller was the principal uh, investigator on a study that I was involved in that showed that you could reduce arrests for violent offenses if you gave young people jobs over the summer with some help to do well in those jobs we know that mentoring programs can be effective uh, there's a number of things that can be helpful and I think that it's actually much the right way to think about this problem is not to fight about, you know, which ultimate cause is really the true cause, but to say, what do we know how to do that can be helpful? I do think that we tend to hold local policymakers overly accountable for these problems and that we've had national policy failures that make themselves felt in the neighborhoods of the south side of Chicago, where you have the foreclosure crisis, where you have incredibly high rates of unemployment and and uh and so on uh and and we you know we really have to deal with this as a nation and we and we have a national policy failure okay. on guns too uh so i would say let's let's okay. focus on you know in a methodical way on what seems to be helpful uh rather than to try to uh, uh you know get in i think the sort of culture war type debates that we were in uh you okay. know were not okay. didn't lead us to effective policies well, but, but I don't think that's what I'm suggesting. I, I agree with that. And I take it that the cities have their problems. I mean, it, that, you know, and it's certainly not Rahm Emanuel's fault, for example, that there is a lot of killings in Chicago in the South Side and the West Side. Mm -hmm. but, but here's what I'm saying. Um, however tough times might be, you so value the life of another human being that you're willing to snuff it out. I mean, uh, and and. That behavior is manifest with a frequency in some 
uh, quarters of our society that are highly uh, specific and identifiable to a vastly greater extent than, uh, than elsewhere. Um, so that, I mean, I'm just, I'm just sort of drawing attention back onto that because, you know, uh, I'm not proposing this as a solution, but there does seem to be a values problem here. I mean, I'm not saying go preach to people, but I'm saying taking a life is a really extraordinary thing. Well, you know, I agree with that and I disagree with that. I definitely think that there is a value, there is this values issue. And there is, you know, it's no coincidence to me that the effective intervention that I was involved with was called becoming a man and dealt with a lot of the issues that young men face that, uh, you know, that, that feed into when violence is an appropriate response to, uh, you know, to another person's disrespect for you and, and so on. But I also think that there's the concept of Nash equilibrium here among young people that makes their values seem much more pathological than they actually are. You know, if you're a, if you're a 19 year old young man and you're walking around in East Garfield Park or in Englewood, you're in a pretty tough environment and you have to behave in a way that is different from the way Harold Pollock behaves walking around his environment. And and looked looked at from the outside, you know, from the outside, uh, it it looks more pathological than it is lived, and uh, you know it is, uh, you know, I live in an environment where I'm highly secure in my person, and I don't have to, you know, my capacity for personal violence is just not important, uh, and uh, doesn't have to be demonstrated. And so, when I talk to young people. Uh, you know, the ultimate values that people express seem very similar to the kinds of values that I have and my kids have and so on. It's their ability to navigate the world that they're in that really puts those values to the test. I, you know, when if I sit down with a group of boys, some of whom have been arrested, some of whom had all sorts of issues, they're all saying, yeah, the violence here is really bad. I'm so glad that you're here working on this problem. Uh, you know, my cousin was shot. Yeah. I'm worried about it. Uh, but this is the life that I'm in and it's a pretty tough life. And, you know, you're the shrimpy nerdy guy and it's not a problem for you, but that's not the way my life, uh, you know, can go. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me take a point of privilege as a economics mm -hmm. professor, because uh, I was playing devil's advocate to a certain extent earlier in this conversation by saying, Oh, what's up with these young black guys? Uh, I do think there are some issues there, you know, a few more fathers uh, with uh, exerting uh demonstrable guiding uh, hand of uh, maturity and uh, responsibility in their lives might yep. not hurt, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, I believe that mm -hmm. for a long time, but, but I think you're making a really fundamental point and I, I want to underscore it. And I say point of privilege is economics professor, because I see the model. I see exactly how this works. So the point you're making is in an interactive system, there's more than one level of behavior in this case, violence. That's, sort of mutually consistent with rationality, more than one level in a given uh, community. Um, it could be a low level of, uh, you know, the use of violence against other people. And given that it's a low level, that is an environment in which most people would be prepared to restrain from violence, or it may be a high level. And given that it's a high level, that's an environment in which the very same types of people with the very same values would feel themselves uh, rationally impelled to use mm -hmm. violence. And the model that I see has, it's just very simple on the horizontal, there's the number of people believed to be carrying guns. And on the vertical, there's the fraction of the population who would want to carry given that that number was believed to be carried. Yeah. Okay, so I see a curve relating these two things. As more people are believed to be carrying, more people will cross over a threshold of their own personal safety concern that will lead them to carry. And where that curve cuts across the 45 degree line, we're going to have stable rates of carry in the community. There's no reason why it can't cross that line at more than one point, which means there's no reason why the same values couldn't be consistent with either a low or a high level of the carrying of weapons and the use of those weapons in a given community. End of lecture. But you is see there, what I mean? I think there's a, is it Russell Cooper has that paper? There's a paper that's often cited in the New Keynesian uh, economics uh, literature that's sort of coming into focus on multiple equilibria that uh, uh, I think you're right. It, uh, the, yeah. um, uh, by the way, the, one of the issues where some of the broader social issues come in, into play is we would, I think there's a lot of reason to think if we could focus specifically on the guns 
we could actually do some good. Now, part of what that requires is treating young people who are carrying guns pretty stringently so that we can ratchet up the cost of carrying a gun around. That is a very hard sell in the communities that are most at risk from these guns because of the over-incarceration experience we've had in the drug war. And one of the... you got evidence. I guess i got to ask you this. You've got evidence that the... the uh, uh, Proclivity to carry a gun is responsive to the incentives created by toughening the penalties for being caught with guns. We have some evidence. Because I, I want to see We have that some evidence. evidence for that. It's imperfect evidence for that. There's evidence. If you look, there's been some studies of gun patrols in Pittsburgh, for example, where in particular, uh, in particular places they would ratchet up the intensity of gun enforcement. And what you would see is fewer gunshot wounds. You know, Jens, had, Jens Ludwig has a paper on that. Uh, we also, from our interviews, we when we talk to people, it's very clear people feel very clearly, uh, uh, you know, that they'll express the same, I'd rather get caught with my gun than without my gun. And the deterrent message is a little fuzzy if you get caught with your gun, but you haven't committed any other crime. And you compare that with the high cost to you of getting caught without your gun when you really need it. And uh, so I don't think the evidence is uh, is dispositive. But I think that we have we have, we have a variety yeah, so, of evidence that, that suggests that it's a it's a promising approach to think that that increasing the certainty of apprehension may be helpful. And certainly the New York experience is one. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because because the first point you made was about the penalty. Now you're yes. talking about the certainty yeah. of apprehension, which is yes. a different thing. Certainty of apprehension doesn't have to lead to a whole lot of people going to jail. But a mandatory minimum sentence or a tack on of 10 years or prosecutorial discretion. Mm-hmm. To ratchet it up to some mandatory minimum would get them to plead to something. Could be adding three, four, five, seven years to the amount of time somebody. Yeah, in general, I'm I'm a much I'm much more. And that's the thing I want to know whether there's evidence. That's what I want to know whether or not there's evidence that uh, lengthening the sentences in a way that would materially affect the rate of incarceration in the community would deter. I I think there's much better. There's much more reason to think that increasing the certainty of apprehension. Uh, would be good than there is that there's evidence that increasing the length of the term is good. I think that I, I in general, am not a big fan of long, long terms. I think that that the human cost is so high and the evidence that they actually give us a lot of crime benefit is pretty low uh, for most things. Uh, uh, so I, I would I, 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 I would much rather see more people being reliably captured and sentenced to shorter terms than I would like to see these long terms being imposed. And I think these long terms also undermine the the legitimacy of the system in the eyes of many people. And uh, uh, so yeah. I, I, I think we're on okay, the same Karen. side, perhaps, of that. Yeah, yeah I mean, let's talk about cool. something else. Um, so uh, you had a, a commentary or something about... Uh, Pope Francis at uh, Yad Vashem. And uh, I had a reaction of, uh, how was that diffidence or kind of not being, not sharing your uh, sense of moral well, I think you your, your word that? was annoying. You found it annoying. Uh, the, uh, well, so the Pope, I'm a... Tiresome. Tiresome. No, no, no. The word was not annoying. The oh, word I'm was sorry. tiresome. Uh, they're, uh, oh, no, that's different. That's different. Enough. There, um, well, so I think we both admire greatly Pope Francis in all sorts of ways, and and certainly if he can be helpful in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian dispute, you know we all would welcome that. Uh, there, but it's funny, and I, he came to to he spoke to the Palestinians and he spoke to Israelis and was very moving. He he, he uh, uh, said all the right things to some Holocaust survivors and. He talked about the suffering of Palestinians and of Israelis who are the victims of uh, terrorist attacks. And then he goes and he gives a speech at Yad Vashem. And I was, and I was actually jarred by it. At first I liked it and then I thought about it. I thought, you know, I don't like this so much. And in, in a way it was because I was thinking about some of the issues that ta Coates talked about in the reparations essays that he's written, uh, that there's probably no spot on the planet Earth where a pope has less moral standing than at Yad Vashem because really he showed up as an individual pilgrim of goodwill offering his you know, mediation to both sides and his own moral authority. But he's also 
he's the leader of an institution uh, which uh, who's uh, which failed dramatically uh, during the, the Holocaust and which has never really owned up to the depth of the misconduct uh, that Pope Pius, uh, you know, was a party to and and that the Pope okay, should, you know, that me, the, if the Pope is question. at that spot, he has to somehow engage that, uh, it seemed to me. And, and, and so I was dissatisfied. Okay. Let, let me mm-hmm. ask you a question. Um, I, so mm-hmm. here's my question. So there's the Catholic Church. And it's a piece of work. I'm sure that, you know, there's a lot that could be said. There's a lot, a lot that mm-hmm. could be said uh, that would be profoundly critical and would raise all kinds of moral yep. questions. It's to be judged. We're going to judge the moral authority of the Pope, of the Prince of the Catholic Church, based upon how the Church reacted uh, to the events of uh, 1933 to 1945. I mean, really? That becomes the fulcrum of his moral standing? I mean, whatever the merits of the argument about what was and was not done, uh, isn't it a bit presumptuous or even tiresome? that someone would pronounce upon his moral authority based upon that, that becomes the fulcrum of the moral authority of the Catholic Church? That seems to be a little bit presumptuous well, to me. I mean, without, without, if I have to say it, and I will say it, without in any way taking away from um, the Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about the slavery, reparation, the injury, or whatnot, I mean, I can relate to the idea of uh, a sense of moral outrage, of grievance, of uh, victimization and of a demand for a recognition of the claim uh, that is deep-seated in that last over generations, over mm-hmm. centuries. But I don't think the Catholic Church is rightly judged, or I don't think that this Pope's moral authority, moral authority on the world stage to do so much good, no place that he has less moral authority when he stands at Yad Vashem. Uh, you know, as I say, and I, I'll say it just for the final time, it seems to me a bit presumptuous that uh, that would be taken to be the fulcrum of uh, the judgment of the moral authority. Well, let, of me, let me respond in a couple of ways to that. One is that he's in the process of, uh, you know, there's a process of sainthood going on for Pope Pius XII. And uh, so the church itself is choosing to sanctify the behavior, you know, the, the man who is in question. And, and I so... And so, so issue number one is that they they have themselves identified with uh, with this. And uh, the second is that in some ways the the church's behavior in the Holocaust is really uh, a stalking horse for some of the big issues within the church uh, about about the reforms of Vatican II. And and to the extent that we as as a religion as as an institution can can frankly uh, and transparently address uh, our own shortcomings. And this, you know, this, is, this is 70 years ago now. It's not as if there's individuals who are now in authority in the church who are personally culpable in the way, you know, the, this is not like the child abuse scandal. This is, this is really a question, can we confront our own history uh, in an honest way? And, and, and actually, I'm a huge fan of Vatican II. I think it is, I wish that every, you know, I think it's a remarkable act of self-reflection and reform. Uh, it is, uh, 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 you know, so, so there's a lot that's at stake here. And I, I do think that, that, you know, if you're standing at Yad Vashem, it does, you know, a third of the Jews in the world were murdered uh, in the living memory of a hell of a lot of people. Uh, and it's not that it's not that the church should pay reparations for that or that the church bears primary responsibility, but I think that they do owe just an honest accounting of what happened and what was our role in this. What was our role in returning? You know, there, I mean, there's just a lot of issues that uh, that come up. You know, the, the, after the war, the uh, the church hindered the return of baptized yeah. Jewish uh, children to their families. There's just a lot that's going on there, and. Uh, and if you're in that spot, it is appropriate for people to say, "Hey, what happened?" You know, it's uh, and well, you know. let's not get into. Uh, okay, I, there are too many points on the table. I, I'd like to have an mm-hmm. opportunity to respond. I also I saw what you wrote about the uh, failure of the church to return mm-hmm. baptized children, and I thought 
that issue reminded me of the adoption of the children of Native American families by white Americans in the United States and the uh, brouhaha's that have arisen over that. You know, communal claims yeah, on children. Very much so, yes. Time. You know, birth, is the child identified by the birth, uh, you know, by blood and this kind of thing. So those, those questions are not at all obvious to me what the right answers are. Certainly not so obvious that one has a right to moral condemnation of another for having a different point of view about it. But I wanted mm -hmm. to make a different point. You say there's no place uh, uh, where the Pope of the Catholic Church has less authority than Yad Vashem, given the way the church behaved during yeah. uh, the war, during the Holocaust. I should and, say, by the um, way, that the many people say, in the church behaved quite heroically. And it's really, I mean, I, I'm not, I can't make a blanket statement about millions and millions of people and many, many religious figures, but the Pope and many, and there's an aspect that needs to be, so I, I, I don't want, I just need to put that caveat there. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no problem. I'm not going to forget what I was trying to say, which was that um, a, 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 a you know, mischievous pundit might say, there's no place on earth other than, uh, there's no place uh, where a person has less authority to say that a person has moral authority than uh, standing in the shadow of this occupation that's been uh, perpetrated now for decades uh, and witnessing the domination of these people who've been rendered uh, stateless and uh, uh, refugee status uh, for uh, nearly three quarters of a century, who were not allowed to come to, back to their homes uh, after they were dispersed during uh, the uh, uh, chaos of conflict. Um, no place where a person has less authority to wax about the moral authority of somebody uh, than in the shadow of that occupation. Well, I guess I would say that, say. you know, Mr. You know, my neighbor up the street in Rochester who was hidden in his house, uh, you know, he's no more responsible for the mistreatment of the Palestinians than his plight, than it's appropriate to cite his plight as a way to justify the mistreatment of Palestinians. I think that those issues are really quite separate. And in fact, I think the fact that you found it tiresome in part is a reaction to the use of the Holocaust as a rhetorical and political device over a long period of time, you know, in the in the context of the Arab Israeli conflict, which we're really these are really quite separate issues. And uh I don't think they're separate though, Harold. I see what you mean. I agree that that there is this uh, reaction from a lot of people, myself included, to the deployment of the victimization of the Jews on behalf of certain political or ideological objectives, which are questionable on their face. I agree with that. But I don't see how you can say that I, I, I certainly and, and more over giving me my caveat. I wouldn't say that the person who had to hide to keep from being shipped uh, in a, a freight car to an industrial death camp. Uh, and managed to survive, although his entire family may have gotten wiped out, uh, needs to uh, have his claim on our attention qualified by whatever it is that his co-religionists might or might not be doing in the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. His, uh, his, his right to my attention is every bit as compelling regardless. Mm -hmm. I would agree to that. But, but when uh, Benjamin Netanyahu says that this or that cannot be allowed to happen. I don't know whether it has to do with Iran, whether it has to do with Hamas, whether it has to do with the Hezbollah or whatever, because we're not gonna allow another Holocaust to be perpetrated. When he says that uh, the ingathering of the Jewish people in, uh, in the Jewish state is a necessity and an opposition to uh, the prerogatives of that state is in effect a, a kind of visitation of some second Holocaust upon the Jewish people. How can I not equate those things? I mean, no, but I don't that think up. that we have to accept Netanyahu's framing of that. And I mean, I, I you know, we, we can have a, a separate conversation about the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. But I think that that the that that I think it's important to keep those issues separate and that, you know, I, I don't think that it's appropriate. I, I think the Holocaust is a terrible framing to think about, uh, you know, if you, the, the apocalyptic nature of the Holocaust is a as a as a political symbol can easily lead people to the rejection of negotiation with their adversaries and to a you know and to a sort of manichaean view of of you know contemporary politics and and uh you know power diplomacy and I certainly would reject that uh but I, I think it is 
you know, I, I just think that I would keep that separate. And, uh, you know, Israelis and Palestinians have enough on their plate to uh, uh, to find a way to live together decently, uh, you know, without the Holocaust uh, being, uh, you know, without the Holocaust being brought in, uh, you know, into that discussion. And I think that and to the extent that the and to the extent that that um, I think part of I mean, it is true that as part of the Israeli psyche and the Jewish psyche that the Holocaust happened. And I think one has to honor the Holocaust as a historic event uh, and to appreciate why Israelis and, and, and Jews around the world are so scarred by it. But I think that okay, we need here. to I, I would love to see the Holocaust removed from contemporary political disputes as much as possible uh and and just you know well so so here's the thing here's the thing so um but for the holocaust uh and the memory of it the legitimacy of the zionist claim i mean the uh as it were right of the state of israel to exist i'm not questioning that right i'm not questioning that right. i'm not questioning that right. but you hear what i'm saying I'm saying there was a transformation. I mean, the international uh, uh, community, the global powers, I mean, it, it all had to come to be mm -hmm. understood to be legitimate. That, is, that, that uh, uh, claim is, it seems to me, fundamentally rooted in uh, the victimization of Jewish people uh, by uh, the Nazis and uh, mm -hmm. so forth in, uh, in that period. Uh, so, I, you know, otherwise, otherwise the ethnocentrism I've got a nation state defined in terms of uh, race, basically, uh, and whatnot, and uh, the need to maintain a Jewish majority in the state. Uh, these are all ex just taken as political claims on their face, extraordinary. Uh, it's only the spe uh, historical specificity of the victimization of the Jewish people that makes those claims tenable, it seems to me. And the behavior of the state of Israel in the post-1967 period has come very close to, to, it seems to me, squandering that moral capital, or at least placing well, it in grave jeopardy. Well, excuse me for I mean, the Israel grant, is an expression of it includes, you know, there's, you know, it includes Jewish nationalism and and the aspiration for a Jewish nation state, uh, you know, on the land of Israel. It's, uh, uh, I, I think that it is. Uh, uh, it's. I think its legitimacy. I mean, it, it exists as a country. It is. Uh, we we can. Uh, you know, we we can have a whole discussion about whether France or Belgium or Israel or many of the places should exist. It's there. Uh, it, it's appropriate to judge Israel's treatment of uh, its its non-Jewish minority and and of Palestinians by uh, by by standards of human rights. And uh, it is. Um, I just want to make clear, Harold, I'm not, I'm not questioning whether or not Israel has a right to exist. I'm saying mm -hmm. that from, I don't know, 1920 or whenever, I mean, that's not the beginning of Zionism, mm -hmm. but it's very early on, uh, to the day that we stand, that it has come to exist, that it has come to exist through mm -hmm. whatever processes of legitimation had to occur. Had a great deal to do with the victimization. Of uh, yes. People yeah. No, it certainly did. That's what I'm it's saying. a historic fact. That so is yes, true. yes, indeed, it does. <laughs> yes, indeed, it does exist. Yes, indeed, it does exist. It has come to exist. But I also say that the legitimacy of the ongoing project is uh, is still in question. I mean, uh, the delegitimization of South African apartheid unfolded over a period of time. There was a time where it was not as illegitimate as it came to be seen. And all of the churning that's going on in the United Nations General Assembly, the Presbyterian Church, the far left wing of this or that European party and so on. <laughs> and on college campuses all over the place um, uh, is, you know, uh, th there's an open argument ongoing about legitimacy, legitimacy of the occupation, legitimacy of the mm -hmm. policies, et yeah. cetera. Uh, and, and so it's not as if that conversation is over. It's not... Uh, it's not trying to wipe Israel off the map to observe that that's a conversation. That sure. Happen. And and I think Israel has to reckon with that. And uh, uh, but I just think that that is it, what matters for that is, you know, what are they how are they behaving towards, uh, you know, towards the Palestinians and what realistic prospects are there for Israelis and Palestinians to negotiate a just, uh, uh, 
you know, a, a just settlement of their claims. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know that I have any, uh, I don't know that I have any much, maybe we should move on because I just don't know that I have, uh, okay. Let's move on. Let's move on. What's the next on our list? So I, I've retired from the presidential politics game. I don't know if that's, uh, Oh yeah, I was interested in also, that. Also, you know, as you that. know, uh, you know, since late 2007, I was a re- I was involved in a very passionate and energetic way in the Obama campaign, and you know, I gave thousands of dollars to the campaign. I knocked on hundreds and hundreds of doors, made lots and lots of phone calls, did uh, uh, you know, did all sorts of things, and identified myself with a candidate who then became president, etc. And and I'm. And it was great. I was happy I did that, although it brought pluses and minuses to me in all sorts of ways. Uh, I'm done with that. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I'm not going to pick a candidate in 2016, and I'm going to try not to get sucked into the presidential primaries at all. And uh, I've decided that, uh, that my energies are much better spent not identifying with a candidate. And I don't know how, how uh, you approach these things, but, but, okay. it's, but, um, but well, you know, I didn't I didn't uh, do what you did in 2007. Uh, I didn't uh, get on a bandwagon. I didn't uh, I did give some money to President Obama's campaign uh, during the primary season. Uh, but uh, uh, because a friend asked me to and, I, you know, it seemed a reasonable thing to do. But um, I didn't, you know, get uh, swept up with uh, the prospect. <clears throat> um, I, I so I'm not I'm not like you I'm not a joiner of political campaigns I didn't knock on any doors I'm not you know fretting about uh, all of that stuff I'm a little bit more removed from it but I think I will follow the election I'm, I'm just wondering what happened mm-hmm. I guess you invite us to ask this yeah. as you tell us that you're not doing what you had been doing what happened to change your disposition well one thing is you know office? when you watch President <laughs> Obama's struggles. Uh, it's really not all about who's president. You know, I have I have three issues that I care a lot about. I care a lot about making sure that everyone gets health insurance, which is really states accepting you know the Medicaid expansion and health reform. I care about resisting efforts to hinder low income and minority people from voting. I care a lot about disability issues and making sure that there's adequate social provision for people uh, who live with disabilities. And pretty much any Democrat who's president. It's going to be pretty good about those in terms of my own personal lights. And I think we need to take a a page from the book of the Tea Party, actually, and say, you know, the really important action is in Congress. It's in state and local politics. It's in the boring stuff that progressives actually suck at. You know, we get very excited about who's going to be president, and we all turn out for the presidential election. And... You know what's really and and what's really important is the actual blocking and tackling at the grassroots level that's not about presidential politics. And uh, I, I think the Moral Mondays movement is really inspiring, okay. and that's and they can probably use my help more than uh, Hillary Clinton can at this point. So one aspect, so that's one reason why I'm retiring from that. Okay. Let me, yes, please. May I, may I respond? You have other reasons. I'd love to hear them, but uh, I'm responding now to your reason of, well, maybe it's uh, working in other uh, venues is more influential because the president can't get that much done, given what has been uh, the way in which Obama Mm -hmm. has been uh, hamstrung. And my response to that is, uh, it seems to me that you're letting Obama off too easily. You're letting President Obama off too easily in doing that. Uh, and that maybe it's he who let you down. You say there's not so much that one person can do. Well, maybe he just wasn't, maybe he was just much better at selling the idea of doing something than he was at actually doing something. Maybe it turns out not to have been much of a leader. I mean, uh, I know that you're very uh, profoundly uh, moved by the mm-hmm. accomplishment of the healthcare law as being of the historic expansion of the safety net. And I, I see the possibility for that very as well, that yeah. law seems to be working. Uh, not was notwithstanding the uh, the bad rollout, uh, and you know we will see what happens because uh, evidently the Republicans aren't through yet. But it does look like they're fighting a losing hand to the extent that they're trying to keep the incremental extension of the welfare state, which was affected by uh, the Affordable Care and Patient Protection Act, from uh, a, being accomplished. It looks like it is being accomplished. So that's not nothing. That's yeah. definitely something. That's something. But 
looking across a broad array of arenas in which uh, the potential for something really significant by way of leadership uh, to, to happen <coughs> hasn't happened. Um, and then uh, environmental regulation with respect to uh, immigration law, with respect to uh, these wars have been unwound, but the management of the, uh, you know, sort of visionary management of the portfolio of Americans' global interest into the 21st century doesn't seem to be ha handled very deftly uh, here. He hasn't risen to the task. Um, he's not the great man that uh, a lot of people had hoped and believed that he was. And that's the problem. Why ascribe it to the impossibility of getting something done uh, when one might more credibly ascribe it to the ineffectiveness of getting anything well, done? Well, by the way, I have some other reasons we'll get to. I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I, he, it's certainly true that President Obama's made mistakes. I think that the, that the mortgage, the area of home foreclosures and dealing with them, I mean, to me, that is to that. That, that was yeah. something that was within his control to have done a better job on. And, and he certainly, uh, you know, failed to use all of the tools that were at his disposal as effectively as he should have. But most of the issues that I care a lot about, and you mentioned immigration, you mentioned environment, a lot of those are things where what's really needed uh, is for grassroots and congressional uh, politics to both create the opportunity and also to create the uh, the pressure and the demand to do these things. So, you know, is Obama perfect? No. I think especially in some of the management functions of the executive branch, he, he, he there's certainly things he could have done better. On the other hand, he's, he's run a pretty scandal-free administration. He's done, he passed the health care law. A lot yeah, of but they're would wrong. Disagree with but they're that. wrong. I mean, I, I think that that, but, that uh, it's been run at a level. I think the level of sort of personal integrity of himself and so on, given that he's been subject to proctological no uh, probing by a Republican uh, opposition machine, he's done pretty well. No, nope, no, nope, and, and so no question you know, about that. He's imperfect, but I think he's he's basically, uh, you know, is he great? Is he you know the is he Abraham Lincoln? No, uh, but but he's been pretty good. And uh, and I think that he's just not the issue. And I think that that and he's also not where I can make and, and, and finding the right replacement for him is not. OK, no, I disagree with you, Harold. I, I think he's done a poor job. Uh, I think it's not just administrative. I think he's failed to lead the country. I think he's failed to create the environment in which he might have been able to get more practical things done through Congress and whatnot. Uh, I think he's failed to articulate a, a vision. I mean, whether it's about what is what are we doing uh, in the uh, winding down of the war on terror or whether it's about uh, how do the rents get divided when you have uh, financial uh, bubbles that, that burst and uh, cyclical ups and downs. And, and you know, uh, I mean, it's 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 much more tactical politics. You know, I got a wedge issue here. I've got a a slight margin there. I'm going to frame the issue this way. I'm going to package it that way. And, and much less of what uh, a, a grand political vision might look like. I mean, there's very little Ob Obama-esque, Obama doctrine, Obama insight, Obama, whatever. Uh, when I compare him to Richard Nixon, I'm sorry. I know how that sounds. I know how that sounds. Okay. But I mean, there was a visionary uh, exerciser of the executive powers you know, I know how it sounds, but I'm just saying uh, maybe he wasn't really ready for the job. Maybe it was a presumption. Uh, maybe it wasn't just the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize awarding committee that uh, was, uh, I mean, presumption. Well, is really, I, I think uh, everybody, by the way, in Obama the land was horrified you know, when he won the Nobel Peace Prize. I think you can't you can't put that on Obama. He was not happy about it. And uh Oh, no, I'm not putting but, it on Obama. I'm saying, I'm saying know, the, the, the Nixon, the Nixon comparison is uh, not without its humor. I mean, here you have a guy who comes in. First of all, he, he, he commits criminal acts and gets kicked out of office. He also, uh, his management of the war in Southeast Asia leaves tens of thousands of Americans dead and results ultimately in the government of North Vietnam conquering South Vietnam. Uh, is involved all over the world in all sorts of things that after the fact turn out to be either criminal or extremely counter to American national interests. Uh, whether you're talking about Chile or you're talking about OPEC, 
you're, you're really, I mean, he, he, Nixon made the opening to China, which he deserves a lot of credit for, and which, of course, was facilitated because he didn't have Richard Nixon biting his leg as he tried to do it. But, uh, you know, it, it's... It's uh, uh, yeah, Obama. Obama's been in a series of knife I, I think, fights, and he's I done think, well in some, and he's on, done poorly in others. I think nobody is gonna. I don't think anybody is gonna ask Obama for his about advice about doing anything on the world stage after he leaves office. I think. I think a lot of people wanted to know what Richard Nixon thought about what to do uh, at, at critical junctures in the evolution of world affairs because they regarded him as a grand. Uh, 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 strategist in that regard. Uh, and I don't think anybody's going to think that well, about I tell you Barack Hussein Obama. By and large, if you look at many of the things that Nixon was involved in, I, I think he deserves credit for restraint in some key areas and for opening up with China. And I'm not a foreign policy expert. But, I'm making a very narrow point. Excuse me, Harold. I just want to make clear. I'm making a very narrow point. I'm obviously not endorsing Richard Nixon as the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's one thing to have a, the kind of acumen about uh, the strategizing of international affairs to be able to handle mm -hmm. an Arab Spring when it comes along. And it's another thing not to have it. And I'm saying, in my judgment, based upon what it is that I know about the history, Richard Nixon at least was in the club of people who might have had it. And well, Robert you know, I'll, is not. I'll, we'll, um, uh, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I don't know what is uh, what is possible right now in an era of declining American influence in an era of profoundly complicated problems. I, I do think that uh, it is hard to be happy when I look at a situation like what's happening in Syria. Uh, but I also think that the, that it is, it is a bad moment to be uh, the, um, at the helm of American foreign policy. And uh, uh, it is uh particularly coming in and having to wind down two extremely unsuccessful wars. Uh, it is, um, uh, it's actually kind of tragic the way, uh, you know, when we look at what's happening in Iraq now, I, I don't, uh, I think you'll have to talk to someone who is much more expert than I am. Uh, the, um, it's, uh, uh, it's a tough moment. I mean, it's a moment of the rise of China. It's a moment of, trying to somehow extricate ourselves from I think that I think the Iraq war has turned out to be a world historic blunder that has damaged American credibility in every possible way uh, and that just let loose and that let loose a set of forces that. that no one quite knows you know what to do with and um, and it's um, I agree with that uh, so it's and, and and then you have the uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, which uh, I think we are, uh, you know, I mean, I'm very pessimistic about that as well. Uh, uh, but let me let me shift over to something just in myself, just since every the world really revolves around me. Let's make this the last thing. I got it. Excuse me, here. Yeah. I just I'm going to okay. have to terminate the conversation right. in a few minutes because I have there, another appointment. Um, so well, well I do find it very liberating not to out. be involved in the, in any with any particular candidate. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, the, go ahead. Okay, I want to say something. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then I'll get the last word. <laughs> um, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Okay, so now people who follow blogging heads know that six and a half years ago, I was a supporter of mm -hmm. Hillary Rodham Clinton. No, yes. Okay. No, not quite six and a half years ago. Yeah, oh. six years ago or so. And in the uh, primary campaign, she lost out to Barack Obama. So now she's on the uh, uh, docket, maybe to be, uh, you know, in the uh, yeah uh, in the in the hunt again uh, for the presidency. The idea that a woman would be elected president of the United States—that's one woman. Yeah. She's not the only one. But were she to become a candidate, she would have a chance of being elected, yeah. a good chance. Uh, is very exciting to me. That's something that I could get excited about. Uh, mm -hmm. That's enough to get me out of my chair. So there you go. I might even knock well, on the door. You know, I hope that I would wish her well, uh, <laughs> but I feel very liberated by not having to. I mean, there was just something in the paper about Bill Clinton has earned one hundred and four million dollars giving speeches. 
And I was reading that. Yeah, I and, you know, that. I mean, it's obviously unseemly. Yeah. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's obviously unseemly. And uh, and I was thinking, you know, if I were reading that about Barack Obama six years ago, I would have been reading that. And or if I were reading that about Hillary Clinton six years ago, uh, I would be reading it unavoidably from a sort of tactical lens and. And thinking about, uh, you know, where does this, how do I respond to this as a piece yeah. of political work? You know, what, and, and I just find it very liberating not to have to, that that's not my, that's not, I don't have to set aside a piece of my cerebrum for that. That, uh, <laughs> I'm happy yeah. for you, Harold. I'm happy. I'm sorry to have to okay. cut you short, so, but we got to nice go. Going on. Good to, we covered a lot of ground, Harold. I'm going to get hate there mail. I know it, but it it's won't great be to from talk you. you. Bye bye. <laughs>